here's the problem that we're looking at today. Um, we're looking at trying to figure out how to price particular headphones. So DDP Industries uh, is producing headphones, and what they've told us is that if they price the headphones at the price P, then people will buy QP of them. <coughs> and the cost of producing Q headphones is $11 per headphone, and then there's $1,000 fixed cost. So if you produce zero headphones, you still end up spending $1,000, but every headphone that you produce beyond that costs you an additional $11 of that. And so the question that we want to know is, what price should we set the headphones at in order to actually uh, maximize the amount of profit we get? Okay, so here's our profit. Now, normally I would call this thing something like capital P for profit, because we're using little p for the price, that's an inconvenient variable. So I'm going to go ahead and call that M, maybe think of money or something like that. So what is the profit? It's the amount of money we get in, or the revenue, minus the cost. Okay. Well, the cost we've been given directly, the cost is 11 Q of P minus 1,000. But we don't yet have a formula for the revenue. Well, this isn't a formula for revenue, right? This is how many headphones you can sell at a given price. So if you were giving them away for free, you could sell 145 of them. Yeah? So how would I get the revenue? How would I figure out how, mu how much money I take in for selling headphones at a price P? So if I had, uh, if I sold, the Q of P was three. If I sold three headphones at a price of Ten dollars. How much money would I take in? Thirty. I sold three headphones for ten dollars a piece. How much would I get? Thirty, right? If I sold five headphones at twenty dollars a piece, how much would I get? Okay. So this is how many I'm selling, and here's the price. How do I figure out how much money I can take in? Price times how many, right? So P times Q. So this is my revenue, here are my costs, yeah? And so if I wanted to, I could go ahead and differentiate this with respect to P and set it to zero. That's going to find um, the critical points for me. Okay? And so you know, normally in a class, I would, I would ask students to substitute this in, and uh, I would give them about five to 10 minutes to actually solve. For this, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of jump right ahead and uh, do this in a slightly different way. So now that you guys have all solved and you know, substituted in Q uh, of P in here, you've seen that you've got a big messy expression, the derivative is <coughs> kind of messy. Let's ask if there's sort of a simpler way we can do this. So let's start off by taking our derivative, the MPP. Okay, so we're going to start with this term, which is P times Q of P. So we're going to use the product rule, right? So first we take the derivative of p, which is just going to give me like <coughs> q. Then we take we leave p, but we take the derivative of q, and then we subtract off 11 p q d p. And notice this thousand dollars drops off directly, right? So this is because the thousand dollars, all that's doing is it's shifting the graph of profit down, right? it doesn't actually depend on price at all, so it's not going to shift the location of the maximum in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out the common factor Q of P. So I have a couple of things to say about this. First, you might say, wait a second. There is no Q of P here. There's no Q of P here. We're going to take care of that by dividing through by Q of P. Now you might also worry that, hey, wait a second. If I'm dividing by Q of P, where could this possibly run me into trouble? When could division run me into trouble? 
when q of p is zero, right? Notice q of p, we've got an exponential function there. So regardless of what price we stick in here, this thing is always positive. So in particular, this hand is zero. So I don't have to worry about that particular issue. OK, so now to do this guy. We have 1 over q dq dp. Well, that's just a log root vector derivative. Again, we don't need absolute values here because this is a positive definite quantity, right? Q of p is always positive, so this is just my log root vector derivative. And then this looks particularly nice because we have a product of things. So when I take the log of a product, I get log of first term plus log of second term. And then I have log of exponential, the log and the exponential functions cancel. So all of this, this log of 345 is just a constant as far as p is concerned. So that goes to 0. So this entire term simplifies to minus 0 0.02 or minus 150. So okay, let's substitute back in here. Now our problem doesn't look anywhere near as bad. I'm going to pull the 150 about front. So I'm going to get 50 minus p minus 11, or 1 50th q of t, 61 minus p. So, so far, I haven't, all I've done is calculated the derivative. I haven't set it equal to anything. And now we're looking to find where the derivative is zero, right? To try and maximize this. All right, well, again, q of p is positive definite. It's never zero. 1 50th isn't zero. So the only way this quantity is zero is if this bracket here is zero, this quantity is zero. So what does p have to be in order to? It right. has to be 61. Okay. And now, what we would usually do at this point is go ahead and take the second derivative to verify that this is in fact a maximum. Uh, notice that we don't need to do that here because again, if this is positive, this is positive. The sign depends completely on what's in this parentheses here. So we're going to do the first derivative test, which is look at how the first derivative changes sign as we move around the uh, critical point. So if p is slightly less than 61, what's true about the sign of this bracket? It's positive, right? So 61 minus a number slightly smaller than 61. So when we look at p being less than 61, the derivative is positive. When p is 61, the derivative is 0. When p is greater than 61, the derivative is negative. So that's telling us that my first derivative is decreasing. That's telling me I'm going up, leveling off, going down. That is, this is indeed a maximum. All right, so if the question I was being asked was, you know, what is the maximum of this mathematical function, at this point I would be done, right? At this point I can say, I found the maximum, p is 61. However, that's, this, I wasn't actually asked to find the maximum of this function. Right? What was it we were being asked to find? Right, how the price, how the price are hit from. So this was all in the context of a particular application. So whenever we're doing an application problem, we always have to go back and think about you know, what does this mean in the context of the particular application we're doing. So let's go ahead and take that price $61 and ask what is Q of 61? So that is 345 e to the negative 0 0.02 times 61. And we can put that into our calculators, and what we end up with is 101.8844. Okay. Do we have a problem? Is there a problem? So, what does this number represent? Re represents the number of headphones I can sell. Yeah. So, if this were gallons of oil or liters of milk, I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm happy with that. Why am I a little worried when it comes to if this is the number of headphones I can sell? Right, I can't sell 0.8844 headphones, right? So what do we think this number means? 
How, how should we interpret this? So if I priced at $61, another way of stating the question, how many headphones do we think we can sell? Our formula tells us 101.8844, but we, we think, how do I sell 0.8844 headphones? We should sell 102. Maybe, maybe we'd sell 101 or 102. Now, notice, if I was going to sell um, 102, well, if I was going to sell 101, can I actually push the price up a little bit? Like if I push the price up a little bit, this is going to drop by a little bit, right? And I'd still sell 101 headphones. It would still cost me the same amount of money to sell them. So I, didn't, I sold the same number of units, cost me the same number of dollars to produce them, but because I raised the price a little bit, I actually got a little bit more money out, right? So calculus is able to approximate the answer for us. It's not able to give us the exact answer because it's the wrong tool for the job, right? This is talking about headphones that only come in discrete quantities, whereas here we're pretending it's continuous. So this has got us in the ballpark, but it isn't quite the right answer. So we can turn this formula around so we have Q of P is equal to 345 e to the negative 0.02 P. If I want to solve for this, I'm going to divide by 345 and take the natural log. So this is going to be divide by 345, take the natural log. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by 50. Sorry, negative 50. So we're going to get rid of that. So we're going to get our price is equal to 50 natural log. 345 over Q of P. So if I decided, hey, you know, this means I can only sell 101 because I don't have quite enough demand to sell 102, then I can up my price, I'm going to put 101 in here, to $61.42. So notice I get a little bit higher, but I'm selling a little bit higher 101 times, so I'm making roughly 40 extra dollars by pushing the price up just that little bit. <coughs> if I'm like, okay, maybe it would be slightly better if I lowered the price a little bit so I could get to 102. We can put 102 in here, and the price that we would need is, sorry, give me one second. So the price would have to go down a little bit. So I've lost seven cents per unit, so after selling roughly 100 of them, I've lost $7 overall. But I've made one additional sale, which brings back $60 and costs me 11 extra dollars. So overall, I'm actually ahead selling 102 units. So given that I can only sell a discrete number of headphones, I'm actually slightly better off selling at $60.93 $60 rather than the $61 that using calculus would be given. All right, excellent. You've been an excellent class. Thank you very much.